Well, hello, my name is Al Meredith. Welcome to Fort Worth, Texas, where I'm Pastor Emeritus at Wedgwood Baptist Church. We're beginning a new series today on these weekly four years, four years into the Word of God. As a series I call the Training of the Twelve, the lives of the apostles that Jesus recruited and trained for the three years he was alive here on earth and ministering publicly. And so I thought today we would take the first, the Apostle Peter, what I call the big fisherman. I'm going to read from his first epistle right in the beginning and see how he describes himself. And then we'll delve into the word itself to see how the Bible describes him and what in the world happened to Peter. Let me pray and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I pray your Holy Spirit would make it come alive in my heart and mind and in my, th my voice and that it would come alive personally for everyone who's listening in today. Transform us as you did so many, including the Apostle Peter in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter's first epistle, first two verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and spring of the blood of Jesus Christ. We all have stories about transformed lives. I think that's one of the reasons why the Superman saga is so attractive for so long. I mean, here's mild-mannered Clark Kent, daily reporter for the newspaper, and when a crisis arises, he ducks into a phone booth. I don't know how he changed, why he wouldn't bother going to a phone booth. They all had glass walls. But anyhow, he would change, and out would come, ta da ta da Superman. Transformed. That's why we like reading Biographies of great American heroes like Andrew Carnegie, from a pauper immigrant to a millionaire, from rags to riches. That's why we like the story of Michael Jordan, who gets kicked off his junior high school team, doesn't make, gets cut in junior high school, and he becomes the greatest of all time of all the basketball players ever. You, we've all heard of Jared Fogle. Maybe you don't remember his name. From a 425-pound blob, where he couldn't fit in his seat in the lecture hall in college. He becomes the poster boy for Subway sandwiches. He lost 245 pounds by simply eating the veggie Subway sandwiches. And everyone wants to be like Jared, where his waistline went from 60 to 34. We love these stories because they give us all hope. If they can change, maybe I can change. If they can be transformed, maybe it can happen to me. But they only manage to, ex to change the external circumstances through self-improvement. Is there any hope of any real change at the heart, the foundation of who we are? There's an old Peanuts cartoon I remember. All the Peanuts cartoons to this day, even though Charles Schultz, the writer, the author is dead, they still repeat them. They all have four pictures. And the one I remember is Snoopy Dog. He's lying on the eve of his doghouse with his ears hanging down. And the first one says, he thinks in this bubble cloud, yesterday I was a dog. Second one, today I'm a dog. Third one, tomorrow I'll still be a dog. And the last picture is, I... There's so little hope of improvement. Well, that may be true for Snoopy Dog, but it doesn't have to be true for us. I remember reading in several biographies of St. Augustine, the greatest churchman of the Middle Ages. He had a well-deserved reputation as an alcoholic, drug addict, a, a, a wanton rake sleeping around with the girls. And after his conversion, he was walking down the street of Rome or Milan, wherever it was, when one of his old girlfriends spotted him. She cried out, Augustine. And he turned around, and he saw her and recognized her. And he didn't answer, but he quickened his step away from her. And she starts running, Augustine, it is I. And he starts running, she starts running. Augustine, it is I, it is I. And finally he stopped, turned around and said, yes, but it is no longer I. 
everything had changed with Augustine. That's the kind of change we need. Well, good news, Jesus Christ is the God who makes all things new, who transforms us. He's in the transformation business. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. And exhibit A in this transformation process is Simon Peter, the big fisherman, the early leader of the twelve. That's this new series, the training of the twelve. What kind of people did Jesus choose to turn the world upside down once he ascended into heaven? What kind of changes had to be made in their lives as they came in contact with Christ and eventually were transformed? In the salutation, Peter describes himself, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't describe himself as Simon, the son of Jonas, although that's what he was known for the majority of his adult life. Not even Simon Peter. When he met Jesus, Jesus looked at him right away and said, you are called Simon, but I tell you from this point on, you'll be called Peter. And everything was changed, or at least it was beginning to change. I love that old Gaither song. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, now I know he touched me and made me whole. Has he touched you? Has he transformed your life? I want you to know today, if the transformation has not taken place, it's not because Jesus doesn't want to bring it about. He's in the transformation business. So let me begin by talking about Peter's character. What kind of a man was this first leader of the apostles? He had, like all of us, strengths and unfortunately had weaknesses. Some of the strengths. He was a physically strong man. He was big, strapping fisherman, larger than life. Seemed to tower over others with his personality was not his character. In Acts chapter 3, there's a paralytic by the side of the road begging, and he with one hand picks him up and says, rise and walk, and he lifts him with one hand. He had had a life of backbreaking labor as a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. He knew what hard work was all about, and so he was physically strong, rugged. He was a decisive leader. There was nothing reluctant about Peter. He was always the first to speak up. Farmers that raised cattle, like my uncles and grandfather all did out in Iowa, they talked about the bell cow of the curve. Do you know what a bell cow is? The bell cow is the one cow that all the rest of the herd seems to follow. Every herd has a leader. And it's the farmer's responsibility to find out who that leading cow is and hang the bell around his neck. So that if you want to find out where the herd is, just listen for the sound of the bell. And that'll lead you to the bell cow, which will lead you to the rest of the herd. That's what Peter was. He was the bell cow of the apostles. He was a man of deep convictions. He was the one uh, uh, in the area of Caesarea when Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? And he boldly says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the upper room, he told Jesus, and I'm sure he meant every word of it. Though everyone else betray you, I will never betray you. Hmm. To the Sanhedrin after the resurrection, after Pentecost, when they tried, they beat, whipped them and put them in jail. And when they released him, he said, now don't talk about Jesus anymore. And he put the Sanhedrin on notice. He said, look, guys, do what you have to do, but we've got to obey God rather than men. So he was a man of, of strong character, strong leadership abilities, but he had many weaknesses as well. Number one, he was prone to extremes. Yes, he was the first to confess Christ. And he was one of the first to deny him. Three times in Pilate's outer courts, fearful of a little servant girl from Galilee. He was the first to run away, but then he was among the first to visit the empty tomb. His clock was of his life was always stuck on 12 o'clock. It was either high noon or it was midnight, hot or cold, up or down, extremes, cowardice or courage, resolute strength and foolish instability. He was prone to extremes. In that sense, he was unstable. 
Secondly, he was impetuous. If he had a motto for his life, it was ready, fire, aim. He was always going off half, half cocked. I call him the Homer Simpson of the Gospels. Always sticking his foot in his mouth. Impetuously. Act now, think later. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Sanhedrin and their servants come to arrest Jesus, he takes his sword. He would have clocked the He'd have decapitated the servant right there, but he ducked his head and just got his ear when Jesus says, put up your sword, Peter. He invites the whole gang of Jesus and the disciples over to his house for lunch, knowing his mother-in-law is in the bedroom sick and can't help his wife care for all these guys. What kind of an idiot? You wouldn't want to be married to him, ladies. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus just momentarily lifts the veil of his flesh to reveal the glory that was his in heaven and would be his eventually, along with uh, uh, Isaiah and, uh, uh, and Moses. And then when the, they're transported up into heaven and what's left, Peter foolishly, stupidly says, hey, let's build a, a temple, a shrine here, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you as though Moses and Elijah were anything compared to Jesus. And so the father thunders down, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Peter, dude, think before you. Put your brain in gear before you engage your mouth. He was prone to extremes. He was impetuous. And he was overwhelmingly self-confident. Lord, he says in the upper room, I will never for forsake you. If all the rest of these munchkins forsake you. You can count on me, though it cost me my life. And then before the cock crows, he denies Jesus three times. Peter, what made you think you were any better than your compatriots? Luther, in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress, on the second verse says, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Peter was confident in his own strength. He was like the woodpecker that was pecking away at a telephone pole and all of a sudden the pole was hit by a lightning bolt and split and the, the woodpecker was knocked unconscious and when he came to he saw the split telephone pole and the first thing that came out of his mouth I didn't think I had it in me come on woodpecker it's not your own strength the principle here I want to bring you about with Peter's character is God uses the most unlikely people for his greatest glory let me say that again. God uses the most unlikely people for his greatest glory. Here is Peter, this cocky, self-confident, ignoramus, Homer Simpson of the Gospels. And God says, I think maybe once he's broken, I can use him. With God, you see, it's not our ability that counts. It's our availability. I was just sharing with a young man I'm mentoring at lunch just a few moments ago. What Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says, Most, uh, God's strength is made perfect, not in all my abilities, but in my weaknesses. And he goes on to say, Most gladly then will I glory in my weaknesses, my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest upon me and God get the glory through my life. God uses the most unlikely people to do the greatest deeds of the kingdom. Well, what changed Peter? In the Gospels, he's a self-seeking idiot, an egotist. He asked Jesus, Lord, what's in it for us? What are we going to get after leaving everything and following you? As though that's the bottom line. What am I going to get for all this? He's a vacillating coward, cursing and denying Christ to a servant girl. Even after the resurrection, he sees the resurrected Lord, and in a fit of depression, he says, I'm going fishing, going back to my fishing boats, my father's business. I'm heading back to the old ordinary. Peter, how can you? You've seen the resurrected Christ. There's no going back. But in the book of Acts, we find he's utterly different. He is the bold preacher at Pentecost where he tells the thousands of Jewish uh, uh, radical followers, he says, you're the ones with wicked hands that crucified this Jesus of Nazareth and cut to the heart. They said, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, all of you. And 3,000 were one to Christ on that first day. 
standing up to the Sanhedrin and telling, look, we can't help but speak about the things we've seen and heard. He is a stable rock, which is what Peter means. The rock of the early church. He is the apostle who leads the church. He is eventually a martyr under Nero. What was the turning point? What made all the difference? Let me suggest two things that turned Peter the doofus into Peter the dominator. Two things. Number one was the rest was restoration. Restoration. In John chapter 21, Peter goes fishing and Jesus goes to Galilee to meet him. And they're out fishing all night, haven't caught a thing. And there's Jesus making breakfast by the campfire on the shore. And he draws Peter aside in chapter 21. And three times he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I'm there for you. Well, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Well, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Guys, there's no going back to the old life once you've seen the resurrected Christ. Someone has said the Christian life is like riding a bicycle. You're either making progress or you're falling down. There is no going back. There is no reverse. Nothing in this world is more miserable than saints who try to quit on God. Oh, they're the most miserable people to be around. Jesus gets alone with them and says, do you love me? What a risky question that was for the hopeful lover of Jesus. Do you remember when you were in junior high school? I'm confessing now. And there was a certain girl in study hall, and you thought she was cute, but you didn't dare talk with her. You were too embarrassed. And so you'd make a note, and you would pass it to your friend who would pass it to another friend who would pass it to a girl he knew who would finally pass it to the girl you wanted to get to. And she'd open the note and you'd see her and would have a question. Do you like Al? Box. Yes. Box. No. Check one. And then pass it back to you because you were too scared to ask her yourself. And I wonder how much of that was with Jesus. Peter, do you love me? A risky question indeed. Jesus doesn't ask, how could you do this? How could you betray me? Why did you let me down when I need None of that. You see, the point is God is always in the restoring business. He's always in picking us up, dusting us off, and putting us back in the game, no matter how bad we blew it on the last play. I love that about God. Our Spanish brothers and sisters have a story about a father and a son who became estranged. In a fit of anger, the son left home to go to the big city. And after a few weeks of not hearing from him, the father set out to find his son. He looked everywhere, the red light district, the bars, the parties, all this kind of couldn't find him, his son, Pedro. Finally, in desperation, the father turned to the newspaper for help. And he put a, 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 an ad in the one ads that simply read, Dear Pedro, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday morning, there were 150 young men named Pedro who showed up in front of the newspaper office for forgiveness and love from their fathers. This world is filled with people desperately longing for restoration and reconciliation. All of us have felt the estrangement that comes from the sin that creeps up in our lives. Like the old songwriter said, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Well, Jesus restores him. But the second step that made all the difference for Peter was the filling of the Spirit, Pentecost. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in power and filled everyone in cowards, in terror, every one of the 120 people in that upper room. The Holy Spirit, as evangelicals in general, as Baptists in particular, we're prone to neglect 
the Holy Spirit. We're scared of the Holy Spirit. We've seen some of what we think are excesses that our Pentecostal brothers and sisters get into. Oh, I don't want to be found a fool like that. Someone who says the evangelical doctrine of the Trinity is the belief in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. And we've left out the Holy Spirit. Guys, the disciples knew more of God experientially five minutes after the Holy Spirit came than they did after three years at the feet of Jesus in the flesh himself. We need the Holy Spirit. That's how transformation takes place. That's what God meant in the Old Testament. He said, the kingdom is accomplished not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Walking in the spirit involves daily, continual experience. It's unlike your salvation, which was once for all. Walking with the spirit is something that's continual, goes on and on and on until finally you die and the Lord takes you home to heaven and everything's transformed. It means continual confession of all known sin. Coming clean, uncovering the secrets you thought you were hiding from God and everyone else and being transparent about it that you might receive restoration and healing. It's practicing the presence of Christ all day long, asking for the Holy Spirit to fill you. And he comes in power and he transforms. And that's what happened to Peter. Some of us remember the cartoons of the 60s and 70s. Remember Popeye, the sailor man? This rather average sailor that eats spinach and thus he's able to overcome Brutus and all the rest. Bluto, I think his name was. And he would sing at the end, I'm Popeye the sailor man, toot toot. I'm Popeye the sailor man. And one of them, he says, I am what I am and that's all that I am. I'm Popeye the sailor man. Popeye was not very sophisticated. Evidently, Popeye had never been to therapy. He never got in touch with his shadow self or his inner man. Just a simple seafaring, pipe-smoking, olive oil-loving, spinach-chomping sailor man. But there's a note of sadness to Popeye's testimony. An inability or perhaps a refusal to change to become something more than just simply a simple sailor man. He's saying to the world, take me because I am because I ain't changing. But God, dear people, is in the life changing business. Yes, he does love us unconditionally just as we are, but dear people, he loves us too much to leave us just as we are. The Christian life means change. It means growth. If you follow Christ, you can't stay just as you are. God loves you unconditionally, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. God is in the life-changing business. And the same God who transformed Simon Peter, the Homer Simpson of the gospel, into Peter the rock of the book of Acts, he can transform your life. You say, how do you know, Brother Al? Because that's what he did for me. Nothing is the same once Christ gains control. Oh, I pray you'll experience that. Dear Father, may we be open to the changes you want to bring about in us. May we be hungry for the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Precious Spirit, forgive us for neglecting and denying you and turning our back on you. Holy Spirit, do a new and refreshing work in me this day and in everyone in the sound of my voice, I pray, that we might be transformed so that our world would be transformed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless.